Welcome to the Spawn Chunks, episode number 288 for Monday, March 11th, 2024. This is a podcast all about Minecraft, available across all major podcast platforms, including YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, consider subscribing wherever you're listening to this. My name is Joel Duggan, and joining me, as always, is my friend Johnny, the keyboard maker, Pixel Riffs. Hello, sir. <laughs> Technically, my partner is the keyboard maker, but I'll take it. Thank you very much. Um, we've been talking a bit about my new custom keyboard, along with the way we rebind keys in different games and a little bit of throwback gaming nostalgia. And if you're interested in any of that, you can hear more by subscribing at patreon.com slash the spawn chunks, where any of our paid members get access to our Discord, they can listen to the show live, and they get access to the Render Distance, which is the extended version of the podcast where we record a little pre- and post-show every week chatting about whatever we want to. Sometimes the discussion about Minecraft extends, but that always extends in the Discord as well, where people are always chatting about snapshots and the discussion topics we've had on the show and whatever they've been up to. Of course, we also have our monthly Minecraft Hangouts that patrons can let us know what they've been up to, and our quarterly Hangouts show up every three months where we talk about the behind-the-scenes facts and figures of the podcast. You get all of that over at patreon.com slash the spawn chunks. So what have you been up to in Minecraft this week, Johnny? My circle on Minecraft SOS is now dug out to about Y70, which doesn't sound like particularly low down, but if you consider I started around like 108, I'm doing pretty well. However, I have now started digging it out chunk by chunk, and there's a good reason for that. It's really to avoid slime spawning, <laughs> because I realized when I got to a certain point, maybe around Y40, where the cave slimes were going to start creeping in, if I continue to just flatten it out and do every layer horizontally instead of vertically, I was going to be ambushed by slimes quite a lot. And since this is a hardcore server, I just want to avoid taking unnecessary damage where I can. So I started instead digging it out chunk by chunk. And I did one entire chunk yesterday, uh, most of it on a live stream, but then finished it off afterwards. And this is all with a beacon and then moss mining once I get down to deep slate layers. So I got a pretty decent workflow for it as of right now. The thing I'm now running into is organization of that and how it makes sense to remove the individual chunks as I go. And so what I've done now is effectively turn it into a grid of signs, each sign being within one of the 16 by 16 chunks that, you know, create this area. And if anybody comes over and says they want to help, I, I go, okay, you can do chunk uh d4 this time right and <laughs> and it, it starts playing out like a game of battleship where the goal is to sink <laughs> each of these individual chunks um and so I've, I've got a series of signs and then you just have to turn on the chunk border grid that you can see in java edition and hopefully they'd be able to dig out that area or if i go on streams I can say, right, chat, which chunk are we going to dig today? And maybe we can have a poll. Or I've even got it set up because there is a roughly 9x9 nine nine grid going on here. I think it works out kind of 8 along one side and 9 along the other side, just because I didn't align this to the chunk grid before I started. But I can now get randomized uh, letters and numbers out of two dispensers, because there are nine slots in a dispenser, right? So I can walk up to it, press the pressure plate, <laughs> and the dispenser shoots out you know, C from one side and seven from the other side. And that's the chunk I dig that day. So I'm finding fun ways to like gamify it because otherwise this is a slog. <laughs> this is just a big right. dig and yeah. there's, there's no real like getting over that. Like I have to put the time in and be organized about it if I'm going to pull this off. Otherwise it's just going to end up not going anywhere. And I really want this to go somewhere because I've started at this point. So it really needs to happen. But I've now moved the beacon down to bedrock level, so it's going to affect the entire radius as well as it can all the way up instead of the beacon hovering over the top and having to be moved down to ground level so I get the, the full effect of the uh, the beacon's area of effect. And from there, it's just going to be about getting what help I can, keeping my tools repaired. And I've also now taken down the nether portal that I was using as kind of the staging area, this ruined nether portal that was part of the area, because at this point, it was going to be a... 24 plus block drop from there down to the level that I'd started digging out and sooner or later that was just going to be completely out to bedrock underneath it so I've, I've moved a few things out of the area at this point started some temporary storage and it sort of feels like the end of the 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 first phase of this project and the beginning of the second phase You've included some screenshots for our live listeners, and I'm curious, what's the, the what are the little stone grid at the bottom of the of the circle? Like it's it looks like it's a 
Almost like what you would want to do for a mob farm. Yeah, so what I ended up doing was making it interesting for myself as I was digging out the layers horizontally. And so I was digging it out maybe like stripes of one or two blocks at a time. Oh, and then I doing see. that from one side to the other and then rotating it 90 degrees. So I create more like a waffle pattern or what sort of looks like a Lego base plate. Um, right. And and then I was I was doing that for a time lapse. So I just thought I've got some pretty cinematography of me taking down a bunch of these layers and make the patterns look kind of interesting. So it's more than just a terrain removal uh, time lapse. But then obviously that's not going to stick around. It's something I might consider doing for the bottom of the entire project and maybe do something like that with slabs. So it looks like the mining extractor has had some kind of automated process to remove the bottom part of the chunk. And so it doesn't look completely smooth. But I, I'm not sure stylistically whether I can really do anything fun like this until the whole project is done. So that was sort of me brainstorming ideas and mostly me just adding some visual interest to what was otherwise just going to be clearing out a bunch of layers of stone with no real pattern. I find that I do stuff like that too. Like I'll, I'll want to do the perimeter first and then sweep back and forth or I'll do it like a reverse 3D printer and like yeah. take it out row by row. I tend not to like the the real random like kind of sp like rotating yourself back and forth like a machine gun and just like removing blocks because i find <laughs> i get myself a little seasick doing it like it just it's not the best visual thing especially if you've got people uh watching on stream i tend to uh treat it like when i was harvesting a lot of sand where i would grab like a a speed potion or a beacon with with run speed on it and just run in straight lines and you'd be able to run as fast as you could mine and so like you'd pick everything up you wouldn't drop anything and you could just run in a straight line until you hit sandstone yeah and if you can do something like that with with um with mining stone with a beacon then that's that's really cool too could have had some opportunities to like write hi chat or subscribe i or I, de I definitely <laughs> wrote like and subscribe on one of the layers yeah uh, <laughs> uh, my, my my twitch awesome. my twitch chat at the time because i was doing some of this on streams did suggest that and i thought yeah it's cheesy but i'll do it um i'm, I'm not above that that's stuff. worth it and no. uh, yeah the, the, the problem became with sweeping back and forth like that and just kind of running strafing left to right you could take out a lot of stone very effectively by doing that but the problem is that maybe one third of this circle is a bunch of shallow caves that open out into like dripstone cave areas and there was a point at which i was you know regularly falling into those pits as i went because i wasn't paying attention to where i was looking and for folks who might remember this from earlier discussions that's how i died for the first time on this server where it's technically speaking it's a hardcore server that we can you know revive a certain amount of times revival has recently become more expensive so now instead of just oh. one fate coin to revive us it takes two and some people have used theirs to the point where they don't have any left and we need to figure out ways to get more which is through doing difficult advancements and community events and that kind of thing one of the advancements it turns out is falling from build height to bedrock uh, that one will earn you a fake coin. So now that I've dug out a cube of area, like a, a cuboid terrain chunk all the way down to bedrock, I have a feeling it'll be a little easier for me to get that one than it was previously. Uh, but somebody did discover that fairly early in the in the season, was that you could get the caves and cliffs advancement for falling from the world height all the way down to bedrock, and, and that rewards you with a fake coin. So that's my backup plan for now. Um, in the meantime, I'm still working on stuff in the survival guide. Obviously, Minecraft SOS has such a big project that I'm giving that more of my stream time and a little bit more between clips time as well. But I'm planning a wither skeleton farm after the success of the one on Minecraft SOS. The one in survival guide is going to be absurd because it's surrounded almost entirely by Soul Sand Valley and the fortress is already really active. So that's going to be a fun project. And since that's going to put me in the firing line for a lot of mobs, I'm also planning on doing a more peaceful episode talking about llamas and goats, because they have a few underrated mechanics, but I still think those are two mobs that, if we're looking at mobs that could have some stuff added to them in future, I think llamas and goats could do with some added value at some stage. But for now, that's what I've been up to. Uh, how about you, Joel? I finished up the uh, the mountain, the terraforming and uh, river cliff things that I was doing along the Spruce River on the citadel and i went around and added detail to the riverbanks so 
I was looking for places where there was already a point of interest existing in West Hill. So like a small dock, a staircase that goes down to the river, maybe a secret entrance, that kind of stuff. And then on the other side of that, on the plain stone wall that I had just constructed, uh, or I guess terraformed, uh, I went in and added little bits of details where um, the, an andesite outcrop was kind of blending in. And so it needed some tuff and cobble around it just to kind of give it a little bit of a border. Uh, I had some spruce trees and some cliffs underneath the mansion. And I used cobblestone and tuff and gravel and andesite to kind of give like a shadow so that when you're standing on a nearby dock, that gray wall does just look all one color. Like you can actually see the difference now from all angles between the different faces of the rock as it kind of recedes and has a shape. And it made a world of difference and it really didn't take all that long. It was, uh, this was probably like the first half of one of my streams. It was like an hour kind of bopping around and, and doing that. And that was a lot of fun. And then I moved to the south and I started working on the Spruce River as it exits the, uh, the, the town. There's like a little river gate, which I've shared before. Um, and the new thing here is that, of course, the mountain continues along to the south and I needed to change the way that the mountain looked. So I had started off with a pretty large um, like dirt section on the southern face that needed to be removed. And so I did that. And in this case, I actually didn't replace it with stone. It did have kind of an odd shape to it. It didn't really match what I wanted. So I ended up just removing a lot of the dirt and reshaping a little bit more of it. And ultimately it worked out quite well because I ended up uh, taking the views that you had from various points around West Hill and just using that mountain to do this thing where I've been taking the custom cliff and doing like a half custom job where you're like, you're changing a few things, but you're trying not to overdo it because the idea is that I want the view to transition from West Hill, which has got custom everything to Minecraft terrain, which is custom, custom nothing. Mm -hmm. And if that line is too harsh, I find that it just stands out no matter what you do. So this is more like a blend of like, it just goes from me doing like bushes and roots and different specific hanging vines to like just using bone meal on grass and making sure that it's all covered. Uh, I did change a couple of uh, riverbanks to the south where there was like a, a dirt cliff. It was like a wall of like five or six dirt hide. It just looked terrible. And all I did was just change the bottom of it to rock, just change it to stone, uh, made sure it, it had the right kind of shape that I wanted, extending trees so that the roots touched the water, all things I've done before. But it worked out really, really well. And I, I'm happy with the views from uh, a small look off, from the wall, from the tallest tower in the, the keep. You can basically see that it's all been custom shaped as far as the eye can see uh, until the river goes around the bend. And then I don't care because you can't see it because mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be building this river until June. So, so that's what I, I was working on. And it's, it was really satisfying because it's not difficult work. It can be a little time consuming, but it's a really nice break for your brain to go from, I want this to look perfect because the player is standing seven blocks from it to at best, the player is 50 blocks from this. I, I want it to look good, but it doesn't need to be perfect. And so a lot of simple techniques that I've mentioned before about bone mealing a cliffside, running around and removing a lot of the too high grass and any flowers. And all of a sudden, like there's your random grass placement, you know, there's your coverage. It, it covers a lot of the dirt sides. So like, it's just little simple things like that, that, that really helped out and removing the dirt from the mountain made it feel like a, a much sheerer cliff and it doesn't feel as climbable as it used to. Yeah. And that to me was negating the fact that there was a wall around the town. It's like, well, what's the point of having the wall if someone could just walk up this <laughs> mountain and just jump over the wall, right? So it feels a lot more impassable now, which is nice. So yeah. that was how I spent most of most of the weekend was was working on that stuff. I think it's it's really difficult to give the impression of like an impassable surface when we are so used to doing those effectively meter high jumps constantly to get up yeah. most minecraft terrain right so part of it is not only the real world immersion of it it's the in-game immersion of it and the notion that you could climb basically any surface is kind of difficult to get around when you're trying to 
consider the defensible nature of a town like this but yeah we uh we ended up raiding you guys um uh, on one of my streams this week and you were able to run up the tower and give us the okay we are working on everything the light touches uh speech <laughs> but also yeah. it was the first time i think that i'd seen it in a while because obviously i drop into your streams when i can but i don't always get sure. to to check out the progress and I'm, I'm used to seeing screenshots of the town and you've obviously got different angles of the town in here but it's the first time in a while that you've just been able to quickly hop up a tower and show everyone the project, and th it really feels more and more like a complete picture now, and I think has probably since the town has been done, but just these little details of landscaping sort of feel like the essential background detail that puts the, the foreground painting in context, you know? Thanks, man. Uh, I appreciate that. It, it, it does. And it's starting to, it has that feeling now. Like I'm, I, and I realized after I finished the Southern part of the Spruce river, all of the landscaping detail, everything from the main North gate, which is the front of the town, all South, it's all done. Yeah. I still have some river banks and things to do in the West Hill Valley, North of the town and the approach to the town still needs some work, but all the landscaping South of the town, including the rivers is all done. Because as those rivers snake away, like I said, I'm not I'm not working on those, and so yeah, it's it's been it's been coming together, and I actually uh, welcomed the the break at the end of the last stream because I I did finish the Spruce River boat halfway through, and what I did was I I just wanted to kind of get out of the landscape mode. I've been itching to do something a little bit more structural, so I've had this Westall River in in my brain for a while, and this is one of those things where this part of the river needs to be finished. But before I can do the river, I need to figure out where I'm going to put this structure. So it's the situation where like before you can finish the thing in between, you have to finish the two sides. And so the other side of the river is done. I need to finish this um, this in and then the bank that borders the in will be finished after that. And so I had a rough cobblestone foundation there. And I just did that thing where like you use some scaffolding, some quick stairs, uh, I'm not even sure about the block palette here. Like this is just stone and deep slate just because those were easy to see from a distance. And I'm just trying to get like the shape and the size and is it big enough to be an inn? I don't want to build the thing and realize I don't have any room inside for like beds and tables and chairs. So I wanted to do like a quick measurement and just put like, you know, cobblestone blocks where there's going to be a furnace for the kitchen and dirt blocks where there's going to be a table and stuff like that. And surprisingly, the, the scale of it did not need to change as much as I thought. I was worried about it being too tall. I was worried about it overpowering the, the main gate as you approach. But as it turns out, it, it ends up being just about the right size to be like, oh, there's a cool build here. And it's large enough that you have that parallax effect so that when you walk by it, it reveals more of the town as you get closer to it. So that part is cool. The only thing I'm a, a little bit reserved about it now is that I think I might have to move it closer to the river because I was hoping to get a view of the river from within the inn, but at this point you really can't because the bank is too steep or too broad. And so you can't see the river, you just see grass and then nothing. So I haven't decided what I'm gonna do there. I might try to put a window in the top part and maybe the view of the river is what you see from above. I might be able to put some sort of balcony or back garden. And if you can see the river from the back garden, that could be good. It could also just mean me changing the shape of the, the river bank. But that's that's why I'm building this now is because if the river bank has to change to suit what I want this this in to be, then um, that's how I'm going to go about doing it. But I have a few more other things I want to check. Like I want to make sure that the path leading up to it is something that I can do correctly and not worry about too much. And uh, all those little measurements that you want to take before you build something in survival that like you really don't want to move four blocks east you know, once you start putting in the details, but I'm a little stumped on what I'm going to do for a block palette. I, I don't want to do gray and brown because I've done that all inside the town. And I feel like the houses outside the town kind of each have their own unique vibe. So I'm thinking about getting into maybe using some mud brick in the roof. I want to use some blocks that I've not used before. And it's going to be like a, you know, a riverside inn that's just outside the town that you kind of want it to be appealing. So I kind of want it to look a little cottagey maybe. So I'm thinking about maybe some white or some diorite, some calcite or something in the walls. I don't know. It's not large enough that I can do a big gradient, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. I will vouch for the idea of doing a moss roof if you want something to have a cottagey vibe. Oh, Having like yeah. a couple of like azalea bushes coming from it and stuff genuinely does add a lot to it. And it might seem kind of impractical from one perspective, but the turf roof idea isn't too 
illogical, especially for Minecraft once you get into it. I've seen a lot of very successful, like, cottage core builds with, like, moss roofs, and I've done it a couple of times. The Survival Guide Starter House has a moss roof, and it, yeah. it worked out pretty well for me. So maybe give that a try if you're stuck for roof ideas. That's a good call. Plus, you've got mossy cobble, you've got tough, you've got bamboo blocks. Yeah, bamboo blocks work really well with, uh, with moss, it yeah. turns out, yeah. Um, I'll it, try a green one, yeah. It looks like you've already had to turn away a couple of customers as well, judging by these screenshots. I noticed a couple of wandering trader llamas. <laughs> I, can, <laughs> I can imagine you just swatting the wandering trader away, being like, no, it's not done yet. Yeah, I, it was one of those things where the wandering trader was just in my face at the end of the stream for like 15 minutes, and sure, I just couldn't yeah. be bothered to to kill him and the llamas. I was too in my head trying to like get the stairs right on the top of the tower, and I was like, okay, whatever, I'm, just, I'm <laughs> going to ignore you. Yeah. And when you try to ignore a wandering trader, it's like trying to ignore a cat that wants your attention. It's mm -hmm. just going to basically bat you in the face. Yes. So yeah, th they're in the screenshots. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but well, normally it would be a, a sacrificial <laughs> yes. wandering trader. Well, uh, on the subject of wandering traders, actually, next week on the show, we are hoping to invite Mog Swamp on to talk about his experience playing super flat and mog is one of those guys who's had a super flat world for like 10 years at this point so he has a lot of experience in that but is also the wandering trader's best friend because of course you can't get access to a lot of stuff in super flat without the wandering trader showing up so we're going to have a chance to talk to mog hopefully next week if our schedules line up so stay tuned for that and if anybody has any questions for somebody who's become a master of super flat over the years you can send them in to the usual email address spawnchunkmail at gmail.com but I think enough from us, it's probably time to move into the news. We have a new snapshot this week, Minecraft Java Edition Snapshot 24W10A, published on March 6th. New features in 24W10A, new wolf variants have been added to Minecraft. The variant is determined by the biome they spawn in. The familiar wolf variant, now named Pale Wolf, spawns in the taiga biome with a default pack size of 4. The Woods Wolf spawns in the forest biome. This will be the dominant wolf variant that you will be able to find in the overworld since the forest biome is very common. The Ashen Wolf spawns in the snowy taiga biome. The Black Wolf spawns in the old growth pine taiga biome. The Chestnut Wolf spawns in the old growth spruce taiga biome. The Rusty Wolf spawns in a new location for wolves, the Sparse Jungle Biome. Each of those last three variants appeared in smaller packs of two to four. The Spotted Wolf spawns in another new location for wolves, the Savannah Plateau Biome, and appears in larger packs of four to eight. The Striped Wolf spawns in yet another new location for wolves, the Wooded Badlands Biome, once again in larger packs of four to eight. Finally, the snowy wolf spawns in the grove biome. This is a rare type of wolf and only spawns alone. Spawning conditions for wolves have been adjusted, allowing them to spawn on coarse dirt and podzol blocks. Changes in 24W10A, adjusted passive mob spawning in grove biomes to only include rabbits, foxes, and wolves, and button tooltips will no longer appear when hovering outside of the containing element. Technical changes in 24W10A. The data pack version is now 34. Recipe results can now specify component data. Banner patterns are now data driven. Changes to item stack component formats. And player head blocks now store a custom name tag, which prevents the item from resetting when the head has been placed and broken. There are many more technical changes, which make more sense with additional context in the Minecraft.net changelog. Some notable bug fixes from 24W10A. Player heads lose their name after being placed. All tools have 4 attack damage and a 1.6 attack speed. And high damage values break and crash the game. Once again, a full list of bug fixes can be found in the Minecraft.net article linked in our show notes. New Minecraft Wolves was published on March 5th, 2024. If you want to see the individual screenshots of the new wolves in their respective biomes, there is another article on Minecraft.net that explains where each wolf can be found and explains the recent updates to wolf armor. In Bedrock Edition news, Minecraft Bedrock Edition Preview 1.20.80.21 was released. We'll have a link to the Minecraft.net changelog for that as well. In addition to adding the wolf variants we've already covered in our Java Edition news read, the latest Bedrock Preview revamps the Server tab in the Play screen, presenting featured servers and other servers you add. 
This also features server activities and news. PC and mobile players are able to add and edit their own custom server. A few gameplay tweaks in 1.20.80.21. Buckets can once again pick up liquids immediately after being placed. They fixed a bug where guest players could not add trims to custom armor. Wolves now leap correctly at their targets. Rabbits are more likely to spawn in groves than before, and foxes are less likely to spawn in groves than before. Experimental features, the wind charge damage has been reduced to 0.5 hearts per hit. Dispensed wind charges now spawn centered. Wind charge knockback and power are now in parity with Java Edition. Some additional wind charge tweaks have been made for parity and quality of life experience. The bogged texture and model have been updated. The bogged now drops two mushrooms when sheared. And trial chambers will no longer generate through the edges of dimensions, so no more taking out bedrock for them. No further news about Hardcore Mode coming to Bedrock Edition, which has been mentioned as arriving sometime this spring, but additional gameplay tweaks and bug fixes can be found in the changelog on Minecraft.net or feedback.minecraft.net. There's also been a little bit of buzz about the Mob Menagerie article about the Glow Squid, which you can also find on Minecraft.net. The quote says, Here's a fun fact. Glow Squid don't actually produce light. Their bodies appear to glow and they constantly produce glowing sparkles, but they don't light up the environment around them. Mojang's top physicists are currently investigating how this can happen. We'll report back when we know more. The article goes on to explain phosphorescence and how it differs from bioluminescence, but could hint at the developers considering the merits and pitfalls of dynamic lighting. If you want to read the article for yourself, that's at Minecraft.net and also linked in our show notes this week. So the change to player heads actually caught my attention in the main uh, the main technical changes. Uh, I know that obviously the the big headline is the wolf variants, but we're going to talk about those in our main discussion this week. And the player head thing is is specific to me and I think anybody else using the vanilla tweaks wandering trades data pack. You know, speaking of wandering traders, uh, which adds mini blocks to the game, so you can use your emeralds to buy mini blocks of any different block that's in Minecraft from the Wandering Trader, which adds a lot of use to Wandering Trader in late game for people that are using those things for decoration. I use them all over West Hill. And the problem, of course, is that if you place one and you realize mm, that's not the right texture there, I'm going to replace that. Maybe you're using stone and you want to switch it to andesite or something like that. And when you do that, it loses the name it loses the mini block name for like andesite and then becomes player head and no longer becomes stackable with the other you know andesite mini blocks in your inventory so it becomes a real storage issue if you're doing this a lot and you're experimenting with different types then all of a sudden you've just got these unstackable items everywhere and so this will will help a lot i i think in the grand scheme i don't know what it'll mean for heads that already exist in the world. I don't know if that's going to be a problem for those ones that have already been placed and need to be discarded. But I mean, it'd be a small price to pay to have this all smoothed out. Yeah, definitely. And I, I'm I'm kind of surprised, but also happy that this isn't really a vanilla, typical like mm, survival mm -hmm. feature, right? This is really just adding some uh, quality of life for people who extend the game beyond the boundaries of what's out of the box in vanilla. The, the data pack support kind of coming through in a big way which is really nice to see especially considering how popular those mods have become and especially since now stuff like the more mob heads data pack has also included uh sounds and stuff uh for for the different mob heads and that's something we've been playing around with on minecraft sos as well but you see it happening on hermitcraft and i expect anybody else who uses that more mob heads data pack is going to be finding the same thing so yeah, people being more interested in that and them adding more functionality to mob heads with that custom note block sound concept uh, means that yeah, needing to support this in a more robust way is pretty you know understandable. But I'm I'm glad that they've been able to to tackle that in this snapshot. And it's just a, a good example of what they were talking about when they announced the component changes in that. Yes, this is a big sweeping change. Yes, it's going to break a lot, a lot of existing data packs and how they function now. But going forward, it's going to fix a lot of things and also allow more to be possible. And I think it's nice to see that right away rather than waiting months down the line to see like, well, when is the improvement going to come? Yeah. Right now, everybody's just rewriting their data packs, but is it going to get better? But immediately seeing the possibilities is, is a great way to, to roll that out. Along the same lines, the recipe output element of item components, I think, was the missing link for lots of people last week. I follow a couple of data pack creators online and they were kind of going, this is, you know, 99% of the way there, but that little 1% at the end is going to be crucial. And 
it's good to see that rolled out this week. Hopefully that means that people are going to be much happier with the way all of this stuff works now. And it looks like banners are following suit. We now have custom banner patterns being data-driven as well. I mean, th that looks cool to me. I, um, I imagine it's good that they have moderation in place for, you know, public <laughs> places. Sure. Because like, that can't go wrong. Um, we'll leave it there. But, but I think that it is really cool, especially if you've got a kind of Minecraft world that you are using data packs on, mini blocks, uh, you've got the pattern patterns and you're struggling with, I mean, a really good example, which I think in one way, it is really cool to see the resources that players come up with to create letters on banners, to create signs. Mm -hmm. And they're legible. It makes sense, but they're not exactly what you'd want, right? And in this case, like you could just come up with the alphabet and use banners to make proper signs that have actual letters on them formatted for the size and shape of the banner, and then use those instead of like eight different layers to get the right looking letter R, you know, on, on a batter. And, and I think that that's, that's cool. Like, I think it opens up a lot of creativity and for me, it just makes me want to use banners more, but I, I want them to not sway in the wind inside. You know, I want yeah. them to have, I mean, and that's, I mean, maybe they, maybe there's something you can do to do that now. I think it was a bug where they would stop after a certain amount of time, but, um, I would love for them to have different shapes and sizes too. Like when I see tweaks like this to banners, I think, well, that's cool and that's custom. But what I really want from just vanilla banners is like bigger ones, longer ones, horizontal banners, like stuff like that would, I think, make a bigger difference. Yeah, yeah, maybe. But uh, there's room for that to come and for it to fall in line with the new data-driven approach to the existing banners. So I think getting the back-end code in place for these first, if they are going to expand banners in future, is obviously a, a good move. Um, I don't know if you've watched much in the way of exploration of this in videos form, but it didn't really mention in the snapshot changelog anywhere. Do you know if you can put any of the custom banner designs onto shields? Has that functionality been added in yet, or is it just a banner pattern and it would appear blank on a shield? So I watched Sliced Lime's videos, and he's been doing like two videos or three per snapshot explaining like the different chunks, like what this is the thing about the data packs, and this is the thing about textures and stuff like that. And I know he mentioned shields in like a, not specifically that it would work on shields, but they were mentioned in like a, this is this data is now applied to banners and shields. So I I hope it would, um, because that would be cool if if for example on a multiplayer server, especially on a, like a creator server where you all have your own logo or something, and then if you wanted to put that on your shield so you could see who's coming, you know, across the battlefield or you know, stuff like that, could be that could be fun, you know. And I think that that could have a lot of again more imagination and and different applications and especially if you want to use shields to decorate like if you wanted to have even from like an education standpoint like if you're running a an education server or if you have like some custom uh maps that you want to use for for those purposes having like historically accurate coat of arms you know for something on a on a suit of armor would be really cool mm -hmm. that kind of stuff would be would be fun uh because again you can put um to get banners to not sway or images to not sway on a banner you could put them on a shield and put them on an armor stand the next thing we want to talk about is this mob menagerie article if we're saving the wolves for the main discussion this was something else that kind of came up <laughs> as a potential discussion topic and i'm personally not sure it's worth reading too much into the glow squid stuff because Obviously, the main disappointment with the mob when it launched was that it didn't have any kind of dynamic lighting. And at the time, they said, we have no we, we have no interest in adding dynamic lighting as a feature into Minecraft. Like, we're not considering it. And so, obviously, just in having to write an article about the glow squid, because they do this frequently for other mobs and uh, different blocks in the game to just kind of let players know what's out there... It does seem like they are poking the nest a little bit. <laughs> they they are kind of they're yeah. kind of uh, bringing it up in a way that might be a, a sore point to some players. But 
I think by reading too much into it, we risk running into the sort of Mojang Promises territory here and building hype for a feature which hasn't been formally announced and might not make it into the game. I, I agree that it's interesting the way they have written it um, in, the, in the, you know, we're investigating this kind of thing, but I'm ready to chalk that up to just, you know, a, a charming way of writing the article rather than it being hinting at future features. I agree. I brought it up and added it to the notes as kind of a devil's advocate thing. Sure. And, and I feel like it's one of those situations where I understand that you want these articles to have a little bit of flavor, especially when you're writing about a, a, a feature of the game that really doesn't do a heck of a lot. But on one hand, when you say something like Mojang's top physicists are currently investigating how this can happen, we'll report back when we know more. Sure. It yeah. smacks. It, it feels like do you know your audience? Like, have you have you paid attention to the literal internet at all? Yeah. <laughs> the article already concludes with them saying, good to keep in mind if you're wondering what to get for my birthday. And with this being Minecraft's 15th birthday and them saying, mm -hmm. look out for cool stuff happening this year, I can see how people are putting two and two together and finding four or possibly five <laughs> in this case. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm curious to see if this does go anywhere, but I think in terms of... Uh, theories i'm going to be putting it on the back burner myself for now i'm curious actually joel do you play with dynamic lighting on when you're playing on the citadel i don't think we have it anymore oh uh, right if, if you're if you're not using optifine because you run on sodium no right? run on sodium i mean there I, I could probably find a sodium uh or a fabric mod that would do that um i used to and i used to really like it and i do remember the pain points of like trying to light up an area when you had a torch in your hand and you couldn't tell where the dark stuff was because of course the to torch in your hand was lighting things up yeah but i remember really liking it as a way to like get a little bit of a shader feel while still having a vanilla uh, a vanilla um like rendering like not having to do full shaders for yeah. stuff like that but no i think my my dynamic lighting fix just comes from turning on shaders when i get a raid or i do the end recap on my stream i just turn on fancy cam and or I, when i walk around like if i go to like repair my stuff i tend not to fly i'll walk through the world and yeah. i just because i'm not building and not really doing a heck of a lot i'm just walking in the straight line mostly well a path following a path i just turn on the shaders it's a much nicer way to view the world and because when i'm building in west hill my frame rate is too low to to stream and use shaders i can use shaders and play on my own but once i start streaming my video card just decides mm, that's a little bit too much yeah so yeah. that's how i get my dynamic lighting is through shaders yeah i never bother playing with dynamic lighting even when i was using optifine which is the the mod that i've had for a while that's used it and whenever i'm on a, a server where there's a few more mods and lamb dynamic lights is the typical one that i've used in the past i just turn it off um, I, I find it really annoying when you're trying to light up areas effectively. I'd only really be happy with it if it could somehow prevent mob spawns. But I think in terms of the way Minecraft works, that would involve maybe adding in like a third light layer where we already have skylight and block light, having like a dynamic light layer on top of that and having it be something that maybe temporarily blocks mob spawns if you throw a torch down a hole or a glowstone block or whatever, something that's meant to provide a bit of ambient light. I don't necessarily see it being a vital feature to add to the vanilla game, but, you know, like I said, I'm going to put that idea on the back burner for now and be pleasantly surprised if they come out with it in future. So one of the things that I think would be really interesting about movement in Minecraft is because if something like a glowstone block or a frog light would give off light as an item, if you had that constantly circling a small room in a water stream, then you could have like this, you know, this light moving around. I think stuff like that could be really interesting, but I would imagine that it's a performance issue would be my my first my first guess. And the last time I did play with dynamic light was before they squashed the mob lighting. So yeah. it was a pain back then because you had to light everything up to seven or above. But now it might be a little bit easier because you basically just have to have a just a teeny little bit of light to block a mob spawn. And that's a lot easier to see in game. Although I find that without shaders, I'm still struggling with light levels zero through three. Like anything above three, I can say that's lit. But if it's below that, I'm just like, I need to check that. Yeah. Because otherwise I'm not entirely confident, confident with it. I actually, I had a creeper um, drop in on me and explode a path <laughs> when I was working on that mountain river thing on the weekend. And uh, I'm pretty sure that it spawns on the... Um, the wall i think it, i think there's a dark spot somewhere up on my battlement and it just kind of decides to walk off and drop yeah. in on me uh-huh 
Yes, well, uh, yeah, we'll we'll keep an eye out for it. I mean, they, they did recently overhaul the lighting engine as well, but I got the feeling that was more for optimization and something mm. like dynamic lighting has the potential to walk back a lot of the progress that's been made in terms of optimizing lighting. But obviously for the benefit of certain effects being possible in game, maybe fireworks even providing a little bit of light and that kind of thing. So who knows, maybe there's room for that in future. We will keep our eyes peeled for any more news to report to you. We're going to move on to Chunk Mail, and if you'd like to email the show, you can send that into spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. And a special announcement, we have episode 300 fast approaching. We are planning an all Q&A episode to celebrate, so to try to include as many members of the community as possible, please send in a one sentence question about anything you would like to ask us minecraft podcasting video games inspiration keep them fun uh, be sure to add 300 q a in the subject line of your email so that can be easily organized for the show it's still a couple months away but i thought that it would be good to start mentioning this uh, every episode to try and accumulate as many of those kind of one sentence quick fire questions for john and i to include in episode 300 it's a, a format I've had a lot of fun doing in the survival guide in the past, where I do like 101 questions about Minecraft kind of thing. And yeah, yeah it, it, it's it's cool to have that opened out to not just Minecraft, but more stuff like in the general sphere of the show, like the podcasting stuff, other video games, that kind of thing. It's going to be fun to throw a couple of those in there. Um, but in the meantime, we have a more focused email from Sunnybrook1, who's a landscape artist member of our Discord. And the subject is high level superpowers. Hey, Johnny and Joel. When you wondered what Minecraft levels and experience could become, my brain, fresh from listening to all of Brandon Sanderson's Cosmere novels, made a connection to a different magical system, and its core mechanic, Investiture. Simply put, the more levels you have, the more buffs, bonuses, or abilities you would receive. Want to be able to accurately see which enchantments are available in the enchanting table? Better keep your levels high enough for that special sight bonus to be in effect. The effects could be a set the same for everyone, or could also be affected by the type of armor worn, tools equipped, or time spent in different biomes. The possibilities are fun to imagine if difficult to imagine balancing. There could even be specific tools that use up chunks of your experience bar to function, consuming it as fuel. Any fun superpowers spring to mind that you'd enjoy using in Minecraft? Sunnybrook won ground enough levels until they could activate their Turtle Helm invulnerability crouch and ditch the shield entirely. I really like this idea of rewarding the stockpile of XP, which is essentially not dying, with the gift of sight, quote unquote, being able to see or from a role play perspective, predict enchantments. I can also see the balance issue, especially where XP farms are so available in the game. Would this actually require skill or would it just be more player AFK at insert your favorite mob farm here uh, or just like grinding and gathering levels. N neither one are super, super fun gameplay. They're not necessarily interactive. It's just like single task, kind of like put your head down and get it done. I do like the idea of existing tools or armor to increase the chances of getting enchantments though. Even if it's something as simple as waiting to get that first random roll for like say unbreaking three on a pickaxe or something, and then using that unbreaking three pickaxe to somehow increase the chances of getting it again and maybe you have to wait and and get it on all of your items in you know, to to increase those chances tenfold you know um do you hold it do you add it to the enchanting table do you place it near the enchanting table similar to the bookshelves uh, though how do you communicate that to the player one thought that i had was if you happen to be holding a pickaxe as people often do walking up to an enchantment table if little bits of that alphabet started flowing out of that pickaxe when you got closer to the enchantment table like that might be a cool hint is like oh okay there's something important happening here like it makes sense for me to have this pickaxe in my hand while i'm at this enchanting table and i don't know what you could do there could be i guess uh some ui feedback within the enchanting table like you know if you see unbreaking three in there and it says like plus 50 percent you might be able to connect the dots and say oh maybe it's because i already have an unbreaking three pickaxe in my hand that i'm seeing this increased chance i don't i don't know how you would communicate that um what about you like how do you feel about the the stockpile of xp being used for bonuses 
I think it's a cool trade-off considering how hard you have to work in the early game to get 30 levels and so you're immediately spending that on getting your enchantments but then with how much we stockpile useless amounts of levels later I think it makes sense to give players certain benefits from that. I would be most worried about being able to unbalance stuff like PvP this way <laughs> and that's the main right. the main thing i'm concerned about like obviously the the sign off was the, the sign offs are usually a little bit jokey but the notion of being able to become invulnerable wearing a turtle helmet and crouching i i think that's has potential to completely destroy pvp um so that, right. that'd be kind of kind of ridiculous but then obviously there's there's elements which don't make it you know too unbalanced for players especially like considering in pvp situations you're going to be dying and losing your levels if you come across an opponent who's able to beat you and then obviously it knocks you down even further if that opponent still has a ton of levels stockpiled and is made more powerful by them but then just stuff like being able to get more of an idea of what the enchanting table is going to provide you makes sense and is thematically linked to the enchantment table already because you have to have enough levels to even access all three tiers of enchantments. So the notion that if you double that amount of levels, suddenly you're able to see two of the enchantments that are going to come out of a level three enchant on that, or you'd be able to see whether you would even get another enchantment or if it's just unbreaking three on the pickaxe again. So I think there is some merit to that. I think the problem with giving the player more control over it and then balancing it depending on what biome you're in or what other tools you had equipped or whatever, it comes with how you signal player preference. The game has very little way of knowing whether you need fortune or silk touch in any given moment, which is why it it works that it's random even if it's frustrating that you have to go through the table a couple of times in order to make sure you get a fortune 3 enchantment or whatever. Um, the the biome thing also like i like the idea of some of it being tied into the way players play and the game trying to learn from that but it it becomes difficult to create an all-around gameplay approach if the game is assuming specialization and trying to double down on that and i also can't imagine people being happy with specific biomes adjusting the enchanting table when they're already unhappy traveling to other biomes for guaranteed villager trades which has been the sort of hot button issue of the villager trading rebalance so i am i'm not entirely convinced by that notion of it but this all feeds back into the idea we touched on initially which is that xp levels don't feel like they are as useful of a resource once you have fully enchanted equipment and usually mending and i think there is room for xp levels to be used for more stuff whether it's empowering the player in ways like this or more subtle things or simply other things we can spend those levels on i think it'd be interesting to see something added to the game in future i like the idea that we had last time which was the um the skilled tree that most rpgs have you know like having the xp being spent on like increasing your chance to get on breaking three by 10 percent, something like that um i feel like that kind of thing could be could be good and I agree that it's hard to balance because you have to assign values to the different enchantments, like which which happens first. Like if you've got the unbreaking three and then you get more of it, like do you need more of that? Or would you rather an increased chance of uh, enchantment of your choice? Like that kind of stuff. Uh, when it comes to PvP, I've, I had the same thoughts, but I'm not a big PvP guy. So what I was thinking of in terms of how I would want my high xp balance to affect me was i went to the things that i find a little inconvenient in the game so not removing hunger but remove re reducing how often i get hungry and have to eat if i was carrying a lot of xp i think that would be fine you know i think that would be a great way to help end game players feel a little bit more powerful if they've got you know 50 or 80 levels of xp not having to eat just quite as often um, because the thing for me is like, I'm walking around and trying to do stuff. And then I realize, oh, I haven't eaten in forever because my giant town is pretty much spawn proof and I'm always sleeping. So I'm hungry now and I can't run to the next build. So it's driving me nuts that I can't get there faster. So I have to stop and eat. And it's, it's a little, little thing, but it gets a little tedious sometimes. Uh, and then I thought with movement speed, with the hunger, what if you increased your sprint speed? or made a second sprint speed available if you had a lot of XP. Now, again, that goes to perhaps unbalancing PVP. But for me, in an environment where I want to move 
from one place to the other quickly, and maybe I don't want to fly because I want to see the world or I want to experience it from the ground, then being able to like double tap and go a lot faster. Yes, beacons already exist in the game, but that means I have to have these giant beams of light all over the place, which works in our spawn town, but it's not something that I want in West Hill. And I remember when I was doing some admin stuff on the server, I ended up logging out in Dartmouth Meadows. And then when I started the stream the other day, I was in Dartmouth Meadows and we have speed beacons everywhere. So I was like, oh man, this is so nice. <laughs> I'm, move, I'm moving so quickly compared to what I move in West Hill. So I, uh, I, that thought kind of came to mind. And um, I, they mentioned something about tools feeding and consuming XP as fuel. And I like the idea of siphoning player XP into repairing gear. It's kind of odd. Like if you're sitting at like 100 levels and you need to repair your mending gear, you, you still have to go get XP from somewhere else. Despite the fact that you have 100 levels, you can't sacrifice your own levels to repair your gear. I, uh, I like that because it reminded me of Blood Elves from World of Warcraft, which are essentially mana vampires. Uh -huh. and, I, and I think that, that that kind of idea of just like, you know, being a, an end game player where you kind of like do a hand gesture at your pickaxe and it just kind of like sucks the life out of you to then repair itself uh is is interesting especially if it's if it's expensive like if it's something that takes you from level 50 down to level 10 which means that you can't enchant anything you know you can't you know you the only thing you can do at that point is rename stuff and i think that that kind of thing would be would be cool if it had the right cost to it right yeah it it could be an interesting uh, alternative side to mending where instead of mending it has like I don't know siphon or something like that where you don't necessarily get mending from it in the same way that you standard an XP farm and accumulate XP but y the XP still goes to your levels bar but then you can drain it later so you could still use XP farms in a similar way if you were just there you know activating this ability but you could also use it out there in the field and it would mean fewer trips back and forth to xp farms just to repair your tools which is definitely an attractive prospect to me for sure the only place you can get bottles of xp is from villagers right uh yes you can get them in some loot chests but not in any kind of renewable supply it'd be kind of fun if you could use xp farms to fill them up Go yeah like, like a potion like a potion brewer you yeah. know like if you had some sort of auto crafter or something like that that you could fill them up kind of like a uh like a pop dispenser, like a yeah. soda can dispenser, and then use them later. I mean, I guess they'd have to stack better if that was the case, because they do, they don't stack now, do they? Um, I think they do. No, you, you do they? You can you can stack yes. bottles of enchanting, yeah, because people yeah, put yeah. like they they load them into dispensers and stuff to have little mending right. refill right. stations. But I'm even that of potions, yeah, yeah, po potions are a, a, an issue there. But e even then, you you have to use an awful lot of them to be able to repair stuff because they only give you right. about a level's worth of XP at a time and it takes a lot of XP to repair very durable tools like netherite and diamond. So mm -hmm. there's there's definitely room for it. And it's a, a topic that a lot of mods have addressed in the past. Like I remember playing in the old school days of like, you know, more forge mod packs being popular where there would be XP drains that you could stand on and it would remove your levels so that you could just get back down to 30 levels if you had a higher yield xp farm and that would make sure that you know you could return to that well and refill up to 30 levels very quickly after enchanting oh, and that would right. allow you to do a lot more with the, with the level system even before they updated the enchanting table so that it didn't use all of your levels when you enchanted stuff but then you'd also have liquid xp that you could tap off to make bottles of enchanting and stuff like that so the uh the the, the mods can obviously handle xp however they want in vanilla they have to take a much more subtle and low-tech feeling approach to it but there's there's definitely room for it to expand in future i have no no doubt of that i remember seeing liquid xp in some mod pack somewhere it reminded me of, of uh, energon from transformers <laughs> yeah right uh, and, and your your well idea sounds like the the containment grid from ghostbusters <laughs> <laughs> maybe you don't want all the xp to get loose at once that could be very bad news yeah but th those ideas are clearly floating around out there there's a lot of a lot of potential inspiration to choose from so i don't think mojang should shy away from having that discussion our next email comes from Mr. Toby11, another landscape artist member of our community, Astronomy in Minecraft. Greetings, Johnny and Joel. The night sky in Minecraft has never been very interesting. I think adding astronomy to Minecraft would be a great new feature. The sun, moon, and stars could be given realistic movements across the sky. 
There could be planets, galaxies, nebulas, constellations, and astronomical phenomena such as eclipses, comets, shooting stars, and the aurora borealis. We are already having things like the spyglass, which could be used to get a better view, and maybe we could build telescopes to get more detail. Whether the sky in Minecraft is based on our own or generated via the world seed, this system would provide great educational value similar to archaeology. Of course, Minecraft players will want to get some gameplay value from every new feature. Given how the night sky has historically been linked to various mythologies, it could have some interaction with Minecraft's magic system. Perhaps certain phenomena could guarantee enchantments, like if you enchant your pickaxe during a solar eclipse, you're guaranteed to get Fortune 3 on it. Another idea is to have meteors land and you could have them to mine for precious resources, although I don't know how you would avoid having one hit your house and explode it. What do you think? Tired of seeing the same sky every night? Does astronomy have a place in Minecraft? Mr. Toby11 was creepered while gazing at the stars. <laughs> it's it's a, a difficult uh, difficult pastime, astronomy. It does occasionally get you blown up. Um, so for a modded approach to this, first of all, I will recommend that anybody who doesn't mind uh, reverting to 116.5, check out the Astral Sorcery mod. We'll have a link to that in our show notes. It links to curseforge.com where the mod is freely distributed. I'm not sure if it's been updated for Fabric, so this is still kind of an old school mod, and I last remember playing with it, although very little, in the Forever Stranded Lost Souls mod pack that I did with the Cobblenauts back before Survival Guide was even a thing. So yeah, th there's, there's definitely some similar ideas out there in the modded scene. And I think it's definitely a fun idea. I think the idea of changing the day-night cycle so that the moon interacts a little bit more like it does in the, the real world and we have like moon rises during the day and solar eclipses and that kind of thing would be a, a little tough because of how simple it is right now and how integral stuff like moon phase is to certain gameplay elements, right? So like... Moon phase actually affects local difficulty. It affects uh, slime spawning in swamps and stuff like that. And while obviously that's a mechanic we can rely on right now, it becomes more difficult to rely on that if you have the moon rising with the sun and the moon phases being offset from the standard day-night cycle. Because right now, you can skip the night if you want to accelerate to the next day, and you can sometimes even use that to skip nights where the moon phase isn't beneficial to you. But A, it's much more difficult to do that if stuff like that becomes out of sync. And it's also difficult to guarantee that servers with one player sleep won't skip the night, rendering a lot of the astronomy stuff that you're suggesting a little bit difficult to execute for most players. Then again, if there are things that you can do during the night that you simply can't during the day in terms of empowering yourself and maybe affecting the enchantment table and stuff, I think it is possible that players would have better reasons to not skip the night were that the case. How do you feel about that, Joel? I used to have a custom night sky resource pack. I think it was from Jersey Boy. And it had more stars, more colored stars. I don't know if there were galaxies in the version that I had, but it certainly had shooting stars. Mm -hmm. And so seeing shooting stars was really fun in that, in that pack. It required Optifine, so I no longer have access to it. Uh, or I've not attempted to apply it in my current version of Minecraft, but I really, really liked it. And recently I was doing one of those walkabouts. I was going to get some snow for the snow layers I had to put on my mountain. And I hadn't been up to the ice spikes biome in a really long time. And certainly not since I've used the shader pack. Well, the shader pack happens to include the Northern Lights. And I didn't know that. So I walked out of the nether portal into the, into the frozen tundra and the ice spikes biome and just was my jaw dropped. I was like, wow, this looks amazing. And I just, I completely forgot or didn't even know it was in the pack. And having those experiences in Minecraft is, is really, really cool. And so it would be nice if they were able to add that kind of stuff. I don't know how difficult it would be to have environmental things like the Northern Lights or eclipses or things like that in the same way that you get a different fog in the nether, depending on what biome you go to. I wonder if there could be different skyboxes in the overworld that you would have to, I guess, gradually go between if you go from like a savanna to, you know, a tundra, or if you go from an ocean biome to a desert. I don't know if that would matter or if that's even possible. Probably not. I'm assuming in order to make the world feel 
cohesive, you have to kind of be under the one big sky, just like we are in, on our planet, right? So I like the idea and the drawbacks that I think of are maybe linked to shaders. Because one of the things that I have a problem with when I turn on the shaders, which I do use the alternate sun and moon angle in my shaders, so it looks a little bit more realistic. Problem, of course, is that I've just absentmindedly, without thinking about it, have the front gate of West Hill facing north, which is the dark side of that town, which means that I never get a sunny, beautiful photo screenshot of the of my town uh -huh. with shaders on unless i change go to bother to change the sun and moon to be directly above so everything is lit and or i can reverse it to be in the wrong side which would be weird or i guess weird for me maybe not weird for people in the southern hemisphere but anyway like stuff like that i think can get a little bit tricky i like the idea from an education standpoint of adding things like the uh, solar eclipse or constellations would be fun I like the idea of a night sky in Minecraft that might change based on like different number of days past. And at that point, maybe it has to be just aesthetic, you know, like you just, you, you see the constellations. I, I find it really cool that, you know, I learned a lot of the constellations. I think I was in like Cub Scouts as a, as a young lad. Mm -hmm. And it's really cool in the wintertime in the Northern Hemisphere when you realize, oh yeah, Orion, I can see Orion a lot clearer now because it's higher in the sky, that kind of stuff. And I, I still see that. And I still notice that kind of thing when it gets into like December, January compared to the summertime. And that kind of stuff I think is really neat. Um, I love the images from the JWST. If people haven't been following that telescope and what it sees in space, like it's absolutely wild. And adding stuff like that to Minecraft could be very, very interesting. I don't know if the overworld is the best place for it. Maybe the end. It could be really cool to see stuff like that happening in the end and where the end doesn't have any features like moon phases affecting slime spawns or difficulty level. Then if if they do make a revamp to the end, having the sky affect different things there could add all kinds of different reasons to go to the end instead of what we have now. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's there's a lot of a lot of room for the end to be a little different. But yeah, I I can agree with the the concerns about current resource packs and shaders and that kind of thing affecting the skybox. Like it 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 feels like an element of Minecraft that is currently open to customization, and you remove that or you force players to work with resource packs that don't completely obscure that if you decide to do something interesting with the night sky. But I agree, the educational potential of it is a really fascinating aspect of that that i think would be a really fun thing to have in minecraft in the in the long term i also sort of like the idea of meteor strikes <laughs> it would be hard to <laughs> yeah justify them potentially destroying player builds but um terraria has meteor strikes happen after a major boss gets killed and that provides a new metal type in the next step up in weapons and armor progression and so i think there's some fun to be had with the potential of like okay once you beat the dragon there is potential for like the dragon's wrath to you know unlock on the on the world and and meteors to land occasionally and if you either make them like somehow guaranteed to fall outside of areas where players have already built whether that's based on like time you've spent in a certain chunk or wh whatever else it happens to be the game could maybe track some stuff like that i wouldn't mind seeing stuff like that happen in the same way that lightning strikes happen sort of randomly with a way that players can control them ward them off or at least guarantee that they wouldn't come down directly on top of your pride and joy house i think there'd be some some fun to be had with that and they could provide like rare metals that might be either just a a nice chunk of iron ore or gold or whatever it would happen to be or it could be you know potentially a step away from using materials like netherite or maybe some ancient debris turns up in there it could be a, a, a fun way of giving players access to that in a slightly more random way, so something that couldn't be farmed, but one that wouldn't necessarily uh, completely break the progression, but provide an alternative to the progression. They could handle it like ruined nether portals. Like maybe you don't actually see the meteor strike happen, but just this new phenomenon just gets rendered into the world in new chunks as you get to it. You know, and similar to if you have a long-term world and you have an updated to the new update, uh, you're not going to see trial chambers unless you go into chunks that have not yet been loaded potentially. And there could be something like, 
you know, the, the dragon's wrath that doesn't happen until you beat the dragon. But once you've beaten the dragon, now, if you venture farther out into the world, you'll see the remnants of that, of the dragon fight as parts of it has, you know, crashed into your Minecraft world. And then you can dig up different things. I like the idea of adding different minerals to, in that way. I think that's a fun, fun thing to do. It could be really fun if it was like adding a different kind of ore that was maybe more aesthetic. Uh, my thought went to something that might work with the night sky, like uh, Ithildin from the Lord of the Rings, you know, mirrors only starlight and moonlight. And if you would do something in your build that would only show up at specific moon phases or only at night, and it would like glow in the dark, like going right back to that Minecraft article about the glow squid, like there, uh -huh. there could be some fun stuff there to, to have a reward for players not sleeping the night, right? So like players often sleep the night. I sleep the night just because it's easier to see what I'm doing when I'm building. But if I had built something that glowed in the dark, then I wouldn't want to skip the night. Like I'd want to have that, that opportunity in the same way that I think that people that build cyberpunk towns probably would prefer to be out at night because it probably looks cooler at night yeah. than it does during the daytime, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's, maybe some balancing stuff to be done there and i expect people would run into like phantoms more often than they wanted to but uh, there's there's some there's some cool ideas there and it would be really interesting to see minecraft develop in that way so for the main discussion this week we are of course going to talk about all of the different variants that came with the new wolves this week in the snapshot and the question is are the wolf variants in the latest editions and wolf armor going to encourage us to join in a generation of wolf tamers so i'll throw it to you like what what do you think of the new the new variations are you excited to have more colors and patterns for your tame wolf honestly it makes me more excited about wolves than i was previously like i, I don't i don't dismiss this as a feature that i don't care about like they've made the textures very appealing i found a couple of people comparing them to real world animals there's a thread by amakenna17 on twitter i found this through reddit as well but we can link that in the show notes perhaps where they've compared a lot of the wolf textures to existing you know wild dogs and wolves out there so the striped wolf looking like a striped hyena for example and there's a couple of great reference pictures of each of those uh, there's a dole a golden jackal like yeah there's definitely a few that seem like they are not just meant to be wolves or even dog breeds they are meant to be like a variety of different wild dogs and, and and animals within a similar family so i think that's that's really cool i think from a perspective of somebody who's not necessarily a dog person but knows a lot of people who are i am very happy for dog owners that wolf variants have been added to the game not just because they can probably find one that approximates their own dog within this existing group but also it gives you way more options for retexturing a specific variant if your own dog breed isn't represented by the different mm -hmm. textures we have now. And also, if they count as individual textures, they can presumably be remodeled individually as well. So now you can have a resource pack that makes, you know, one of the dogs look bigger if you have like a St. Bernard that you want to, you know, have in game. And that can replace the, the spotted wolf if you're not going to be seeing that one as often, right? Or, or maybe one of the ones that spawns in mountains to give it a bit more of like the mountain rescue dog kind of vibe. And that can fully replace that without completely changing the way the rest of the wolf types look. And that potentially means that people on servers who want to sp spread those dog designs around can have one of these, I think it's like eight or nine wolf variants that we have now. They can be, uh, yeah, they can be completely different from the uh, the starting point for each of them. And I'm pretty sure that there is a wolf texture, a tamed wolf texture, and an angry wolf texture for each variant. Right. So you could, you could, you could leave the striped wolf alone to be as is in the wild if you like the way that it looks, and then tame it and have it be, you know, a Doberman if you wanted it to be. Sure, yeah, I think, yeah. I think, in theory, I'd, I'd have to test it out. But you could potentially do that. Uh, and they're therefore not disturbing like what other players are experiencing on the server and and also just how minecraft is intending it to look you know because some of them i think are really fitting i i agree with them resembling real world animals the one that's grabbed me was the spotted wolf looking like uh, an african wild dog and uh i saw the hyena thing right away too 
And I think that's great because I mean, Minecraft is played all over the planet. And I think it's really cool that they didn't just make them look like North American cartoon wolves. There's, yeah. there's enough of a variety here that I think it's, it's really interesting. And, and I like the subtlety in some of them. Uh, I found that the names, names were a little bit strange in some cases, especially, I know we don't want to necessarily chain Minecraft to the real world, but in some cases with like an ashen wolf, there's no such thing as an ashen wolf, but there's gray wolves and there's timber wolves and like you could have easily chosen like one of those names same as the snowy wolf like you could have called it an arctic wolf which is a real wolf Mm -hmm. as well and i mean i guess with the snowy wolf it's probably more because it doesn't spawn in like the arctic biomes it spawns in like grove which is like a mountain very specific to minecraft mountain thing yeah as opposed to um like a a tundra or or ice spikes you know which is where one might would expect to find an Arctic wolf or on an iceberg, you know, like with a polar bear, that kind of idea, although different poles, but that kind of stuff is, would be interesting to, to see. Um, but, and even some of the more obvious things like the rusty wolf, not being called a red wolf and red wolf is, it's not a species of wolf. Cause I did a little bit of digging and it turns out that gray wolves is basically all wolves. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if, if you're looking at North America, the gray wolf is essentially the, the breed or, or the type of wolf. And then everything else under that is just basically location. Yeah. Like tundra, Northern Mexican plains, Baffin Island, Vancouver Island wolves. Like it just, it just, it's all the same species of wolf. It's just, they vary in size and, and coloring depending on where they are. But in terms of biology, they're roughly the same. It's only when you get into the real variants in like the canine world, when you get into like hyenas or jackals or coyotes, that's when you start to see like a real a difference. Um, but in terms of wolves, gray wolves kind of cover everything. Um, so yeah, I'm surprised that they they have some of the names that they do. I mean, black wolf is is a distinction as well. That's that's one of the types of wolves. Um, woods wolf does not roll off the tongue. Yeah. Uh, chestnut wolf also strange chestnut might be a good name for a wolf but it's it's also doesn't remind me of the color of a chestnut either so like i i kind of expected a little bit more i guess simplicity in terms of the the names but uh, i'd imagine that most people are probably going to call the ashen wolf a gray wolf um woods it's hard because like rusty wolf and woods wolf they're both brown technically although the rusty wolf would be more of like a red wolf i guess um, I like the location stuff though. How do you feel about having to travel to get them? I personally love it. I think it's a, a really cool way to add some interest to some of the other less visited biomes as well. It is finally going to have me learning the difference between an old growth pine tiger and an old growth spruce tiger because they're going to have <laughs> right. different wolves. I think it's honestly going to be easier for me to identify the wolves at a glance than it is the trees, although I'm pretty sure it's to do with the height that the leaves generate at. But either way, there's going to be some reasons to go and visit those biomes that you would not have otherwise. Same goes for savannas. We're now going to be finding, I think, spotted wolves and armadillos in the same place so that is potentially the place where a lot of players are going to have their first experiences with wolf armor because of finding a scute around and also the the wolf just being nearby to immediately equip the armor and test it on them but i think there's there's a lot to be said for adding some biodiversity to minecraft which is something that people have been asking for for quite a long time and i do wonder like I'm expecting a bit of knee-jerk reaction from people who've been complaining about forced exploration in the wake of the experimental villager changes, but I think most people are more concerned about how difficult it is to move villagers once you find them or cure them in a couple of cases, whereas wolves, once they're tamed, will actively follow you. So I suppose that's taking some of the pain points out of having to go to a specific biome for something is the difficulty involved in bringing it back. So I think that's going to be fine. And I think people, especially if you're after a specific wolf texture because it resembles your real life dog or just your preferred type of wolf texture, you're going to want to go out of your way to go and get them and then bring them all back. And I I don't know if that's necessarily going to be a an immediate goal of mine unless they add an advancement for it. Because we already have the complete catalog advancement for taming every cat variant. And now I'm imagining it being called something witty like Fetch Quest, 
uh, for taming every <laughs> every wolf type. So um, yeah, if yeah. if they choose that, by the way, copyright me. Uh, <laughs> but I'd I'd let them have it if because I think it's just a funny a funny uh, a funny pun. Um, but I think yeah, an advancement is probably on the way for something like this because it seems silly to have it for cats and not for dogs now that there are wolf variants in here. Uh, it makes sense. I mean, I I think that they'll probably add that as well. I I like the traversal as well. Like I think exploring to go get them is is cool. I would imagine that among the dog lovers and wolf lovers in the game, they probably are a little bit, we'll say, frustrated that they might have to travel a long way to find a grove to get the lone snowy wolf, whereas the other wolves are going to be a little bit more common. I mean, it makes sense because I think that's also true in life. I, I don't remember seeing many packs of arctic wolves in nature documentaries. They're usually alone. Yeah, sure. You know, compared, compared to like gray wolves and red wolves and timber wolves and stuff they tend to travel in packs and so that that part i think is interesting i don't remember wolves actually the traditional regular wolf the pale wolf now spawning in packs in minecraft i think they just kind of spawn in taiga forest and you, if you see one you see one it's not like it's it's in a group and i think it's cool that they've added the fact that some of these types of wolves in minecraft are now going to spawn in larger packs and then some of them are going to spawn in smaller packs and then i'm surprised though only one is lone i i wouldn't be surprised if the black wolf would have been a lone wolf too right they could have done a couple of lone wolves not that i want it to be harder to get them but i think it could be could be really interesting um i know it would be labor intensive but i feel like it would be cool if there was some size variation i don't want even want to get into the whole model thing because we i mean we just talked about that with people doing custom models if they wanted to make it look like their dog but I feel like it could be interesting just from an environment perspective to have like maybe the striped wolf and the spotted wolf be a little smaller than the other wolves. If you happen to have them side by side, maybe they're like two or three pixels shorter, something like that. Uh, or vice versa, maybe the black wolf or the ashen wolf could be bigger uh, in that way. I wouldn't complain about a dire wolf, but I know that that's outside of the realm of of expectation, but it would sure. be very cool if they, I mean, Minecraft has got a little bit of you know, magic and whimsy. I mean, Endermen are a thing. So like, why not have uh, a, a big wolf just for fun? I, you know, stuff like that. But that also comes down to like, we've got texture packs and resource packs. We now have the data driven, you know, um, components in, in data packs. So like there's possibility to customize this if you want to. And the thing that I like about them doing this is that it has the same um, I'm not say variety, but when you're doing something like a data pack over a texture pack, in a texture pack, you have to sacrifice something to add a texture to the game. So like for me, I have that coarse dirt slab and I'm replacing the petrified oak slab. But if that wasn't in the game, I'd have to find a slab that I wouldn't use very much, probably like end stone. And I'd have to use that but then, then all the end stone with that texture back on would have the coarse dirt texture. So that wouldn't really work. And with this, I think it's really cool in that because they've given you now nine varieties of, of wolves, if you wanted to have something specific, you're just, you only have to sacrifice one. And as we mentioned, if it's the tamed version, then it's not going to affect anybody seeing wild wolves uh, across the server. But uh, it would be cool to see a little bit more variety in the shape and sizes i know they didn't do that for cats but in general cats are pretty much the same size like it's yeah. a huge kind of generalization I, I realized it's one of the things that i was not expecting them to change textures and whatnot for for wolves because of the amount of variety there are in real world dog breeds and 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 the, the sheer amount of the the difference in scale between a chihuahua and a great dane or whatever you know there's you just don't get that with cats unless you're talking about really specific cat breeds that a lot of people don't think about owning or they're wilder cats um but then yeah i i think with wolf variants the underrated aspect of this is that you can sort of match them up with certain types of builds and i think that's a really interesting detail is that they'd be good for adding life to builds if you imagine populating a town like West Hill with cats and dogs, as though some of the townspeople have pets, you now have way more variety 
in the aesthetics of I'm just going to leave a dog in the window here and it's going to look completely different to the dog in the window across the street and maybe they're barking at each other, you know? You can put in stuff like that that feels a lot more lifelike now than just everybody having the same grey wolf. And I think yeah. that's cool. Like, that's the aspect of it that I'm more excited about than actually having a wolf as a pet is having wolves as, like, you know, window dressing for builds, which seems kind of inhumane in one sense, but in the video game sense, I think it's it's kind of cool to be able to pair these up and uh, choose what you think the right wolf is for a certain environment. And you might want to turn down your friendly mob sounds if you're walking through a town and you've got a dog in every window, but I like, <laughs> I like the notion of, yeah, having you know, maybe a, a child's bedroom upstairs with one of the friendlier looking wolf variants just kind of sat on guard or something. Or if you're doing a, a mood thing, like you've got an, an evil tower and you want to put a couple of black wolves out front. Yes, uh, you know, yes, absolutely. If you have, you know, uh, I can't remember whether Fang from Harry Potter was an Italian Mastiff or a Bull Mastiff, but like, again, doing a custom model, if you're doing a, like a Harry Potter world or something like that, you could just do something like that would be very effective. Um, I, I think it could have a lot of fun applications. And I like the the thing about wolves and cats that are great, unlike pigs and horses, is that you don't have to like rope them and contain them. You don't have to put fences around them. You don't have to lead them to stuff. You can tell them to sit and they're going to stay there. Yeah. Uh, I have a dog on the server that's been sitting for six years. <laughs> <laughs> and very patient. a little dog outside my cabin. Very, very yeah. well trained. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's cool. Um, do you have a favorite? Out of these, probably the Spotted Wolf, but it also looks kind of like... I, I like Calico Cats that have that kind of patchwork uh, fur to them, and, and that's that's probably close to my favorite. But I, I don't mind the Ashen Wolf either. Like like you, the, the name I can kind of take or leave. It doesn't really matter too much, but yeah. I think there's just enough like variety in the, in the grays of the texture that I think it looks really nice. So I think it's between those two for me. How about you? Uh, the Ashen Wolf and the Woods Wolf, again, not crazy about the names, but those are the two that I think of when I think of wolves. Like when I see nature documentary, probably because I live in North America, but like when I think about wolves in those kind of connotations, that's what I think of. And they also look like huskies as well. So anybody that wants a a, a husky or has a husky that's white, gray, or that kind of like mottled brown, I think will probably gravitate towards my favorite is actually the black wolf i uh -huh. think it's 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 got that really high contrast it's uh the eyes really stand out it's not like dead black it has like a nice gradient and pixelation to the texture and stuff and i'll include a, a clip in our live chat about it's just a clip of a of a timber wolf in northern saskatchewan and uh they're big mm -hmm. <laughs> and just even if i don't have a bigger model my i can just kind of imagine having something the size of a irish wolfhound <laughs> <laughs> as a wolf around my minecraft build that would be very fun in terms of whether this is going to turn me into a wolf user in terms of like pve gameplay um and, and going outside of the building category and into more just exploration and stuff i don't know if i'm going to be using them in the long term but i think in the short term if i like start a fresh world for whatever reason i might consider it i think in the short term they would provide a pretty helpful companion i don't know if it's just not really an aspect of my long-term gameplay style that I enjoy. Like, in any game, not just in Minecraft, I'm not really, like, a summoner class kind of person. Like, I, I much mm. prefer being the one who's, like, in the thick of it and having control of the action instead of, you know, having to rely on mob AI in order to have a, a support in in a fight. And, yeah, the same goes for, like, if I'm playing, say, Elden Ring or something like that. I don't rely on the summons too much in that game unless I absolutely have to. And so I don't know if I want to use them long term, but I can really see them being ideal for explorers because there are going to be folks out there who don't always have fully upgraded armor and an XP farm so they can restore it and they just want to roam the world. And I think there'd be a, a lot of fun to be had in picking up wolves as you go and maybe armoring them up if you find a savannah biome and some armadillos and then keeping them traveling with you. And it feeling like, you know, you're going on a road trip with your with your road dogs, as it were, <laughs> um, instead of, you know, having to consider them as as pets, consider it like running with the pack. I think that'd be kind of fun. I'm still waiting for the PvP community to weigh in on whether or not we're going to end up with a wolf meta, because right now wolf armor seems quite strong if it has to break before the wolf even takes damage. And you can imagine if it's being repaired with uh armadillo scutes i don't know if there's a cooldown on that there might be but 
imagining repairing it as you go and this wolf just constantly being able to attack and it becomes more about like like a pokemon battle almost where you're like powering up and right. like loading up healing items into your 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 wolf to make sure that it doesn't crack before the the opponent's wolf does i feel like that's potentially the issue we're going to run into but i haven't heard necessarily whether that feels balanced the only feedback i heard from it last time was that it felt unbalanced because of the bug we mentioned in the java change log where everything was just doing the damage of like a wooden hoe you know it wasn't really doing a great deal of damage for like netherite swords with sharpness or whatever but i expect once you've got a fully powered up sword you can probably break wolf armor within a couple of hits yourself and then it's just going to be about avoiding that being a scenario so i'm I'm curious to hear from the community and and if anybody is in the pvp scene and has concerns about that then i would encourage you to write into the show because it's a perspective we don't get to share on the show all that often I agree. I, uh, I'm not a minion person in Minecraft for sure. Uh, I was in other games. My Alliance characters in world of Warcraft were a dwarf hunter that had a wolf companion mm-hmm. and, uh, I don't remember its name and then a warlock and the warlock essentially is a pet class. It's like a pet caster class and sure. everything you get as a warlock is a lot cooler than a wolf, <laughs> a bunch of demons and different stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but I did enjoy that aspect of it. So, but again, that's a lot of PVE and PVP. There's no, like, there's no building in Warcraft in Warcraft. So, um, in this, like I, I can see that being interesting from an aesthetic point of view, if you're using wolf armor as someone that built the, uh, the thumbnail for last week's episode with the different colors of wolf armor, uh, the wolf armor being so tough, it's a pain to remove if you happen to put it on and then not realize that you can't dye it once it's on the wolf. Uh huh. So for people that are going to be exploring dyed wolf armor combinations with the new wolf textures you need to dye the armor before you put it on the wolf and if you have to get it off the wolf then you have to beat it off the wolf so creative worlds are your friends before you go into your survival world and try to get the right color gray armor on your you know black wolf or your ashen wolf (laughs) do some testing because with the different color combinations that you can get with the armor the way that it's dyed like leather it's it's really complicated and if you are not looking for just the 16 pure you know colors uh in the game then it it really could be a lot of trial and error and if you get it wrong and you're not happy with it you're kind of stuck with it for a while so it might be worth looking into it i i almost want them to have like a little wolf dressing room <laughs> just to kind of see what this might look good on and 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 whatnot but there's definitely going to be some interesting clashes like i can't imagine a spotted wolf with like bright pink armor <laughs> yeah very yeah. very unique you know oh uh, wafer night in our live chat has the solution for you and this was something i was trying to remember as you were talking you can use shears on them to get the armor off again so oh, there you go but, but but that's an interaction yeah. that you use on so few things that it doesn't necessarily come naturally so again maybe right. maybe there'll Thank be an advancement that will guide players towards that as a solution that we just don't have yet because they're still working on the uh, the individual functionality and stuff but yeah there's uh there's definitely going to be a bit of trial and error in finding the exactly the right color to dress up your wolves but uh yeah i think there's there's room for it the the alternative of course being if you don't like the color dunking your wolf in a cauldron <laughs> to get the uh the dye color <laughs> off would be the uh the funniest solution to that you, you don't you don't want to you don't want to have a problem giving your dog a bath in minecraft as well as in real life but we'll uh, we'll see how it goes in the meantime that is where we're gonna have to wrap up this episode of the spawn chunks you can find more information about the show and links to some of the stuff that we've talked about today over at thespawnchunks.com The music for the show is composed by me, and The Spawn Chunks is proud to be a listener-supported podcast. If you get some value out of the show, why not consider putting some value back in? You can visit patreon.com slash thespawnchunks to join our community, where pledging at any level will get you an invite to our patrons-only Discord chat. You can listen to the show live when we record it in Discord every Monday. We also have our monthly hangouts where people can show us what they've been up to in Minecraft that month. And we currently have 320 patrons, which is up five from last week, so thank you to the five of you for jumping on board. There is always room for more. Special thanks go out to our content engineers, Hunter555, Jumbo Sale, Mind Trip Media, Party Voyager, and Yitz. Thank you for your support on this episode.
Sharing the podcast with your friends is the easiest way to support the show. You can find us at The Spawn Chunks on social media. New episodes are available every Monday on all of the major podcast platforms, including YouTube. Be sure to leave a rating, a review, a like, a sub if it's free, wherever you listen. It really does a great deal to help the show. You can email us at spawnchunkmail at gmail.com. Don't forget about those episode 300 questions. The RSS feed is linked on the spawnchunks.com and the patron-only RSS feed is on the Patreon page. That's where you can listen to the render distance, the extended version of the podcast. My name is Johnny, but online I go by Pixelriffs. You can find most of what I do at youtube.com slash Pixelriffs, where currently my main series are the Minecraft Survival Guide and Minecraft SOS. I stream three days a week on Twitch, where lately I've just been digging a massive hole in Minecraft SOS, but that's where the behind-the-scenes work gets done for my YouTube series. I'm the voice of the unofficial Hermitcraft recap, which you can find through a quick YouTube search, and aside from that, I'm at Pixelriffs on both Twitter and Instagram. Joel, where can people find you online? Everything that I'm doing online can be linked to joelduggan.com. That includes the Citadel Cafe, my other podcast about sci-fi and fantasy entertainment. I haven't recorded a new one yet, but I have been watching Halo Season 2 on Paramount+, Plus, so I will be talking about that eventually. I'm Joel Duggan on social media and Joel Duggan on Twitch, where I stream Thursday through Sunday. Lego is normally on Fridays, I'm in between sets right now. So right now I'm just powering through everything to do in West Hill. It's not like I have a short list, so uh, tune in. Thanks for visiting the Spawn Chunks. The world outside is infinite. Go fetch!